This special aeronautics and space report brought to you by NASA. Some of these parts and pieces coming together at the Kennedy Space Center, Florida, have familiar sounding names like the Command Module and Apollo Telescope Mount. Others are not as familiar. Multiple Docking Adapter, Airlock Module, Orbital Workshop. From all over the country the pieces came. They are all part of the United States' next manned space mission, Skylab. These are the three men who will open the space station and stay there 28 days. Astronauts Paul Weitz, Dr. Joseph Kerwin, and Charles Pete Conrad. Astronaut Conrad will be in command. Born in Philadelphia, he is 42 years old and a veteran of three previous Gemini and Apollo space flights. Conrad described the sequence of events, including a dual launch. Uh, we're going to use both launch pads at Cape Kennedy, pad 39A and pad 39B. And on 39A, we have the orbital workshop on a Saturn V, and it will be launched uh, into orbit, unmanned. Uh, when it gets into orbit, the ground will, able, will be able to deploy the solar panels and the shroud around the front of it, get rid of that and uh, deploy the solar telescope off to the side and perform a bunch of functions by ground command which will prepare it for our joining it the next day. Now we will launch approximately 23 and a half hours later after it does and after five revolutions of the earth uh, we will have stepped up and rendezvoused with it and at that time we're going to dock uh, and we perform just a few checks on the exterior part of the vehicle and that our docking is a good docking and we will pretty well have spent the whole day uh, at the task of rendezvousing so we will go to bed in the command module and then very early the next morning we will start activation of the workshop. Now our task in activating the workshop will be longer and, and considerably different than the crews that will follow us up there because much of the equipment will be in what we call the launch configuration. It has to be bolted to the floors or firmly to the walls to take the vibrations of launch uh, into space. So we will go in and the first day we will spend reconfiguring all this equipment to its proper location for use when it's in orbit. The orbital workshop is about the size of a small house. Pete Conrad continues. Well, in this vehicle, we have, of course, uh, quite a few items we've never had before. We have a freezer system so that we have frozen food, which we've never had before. We have three separate bedrooms uh, with uh, doors. You can go to bed and close your door at night. We have a full bathroom on board, uh, and we intend to uh, shave every day and so forth. And we have a shower on board. Uh, won't be able to use that every day the way the water works out. Everybody gets one shower a week, so we'll be back to the Saturday night shower. And of course, all of these items that I've just mentioned are things that we've never had in space flight before. So uh, I think we're going to be a lot more comfortable, and I look forward to giving most of them a try. To prepare themselves for the spacewalk they'll be taking, astronauts Conrad and Kerwin practiced underwater at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. As we get to the end of the 28 days, about three days before the end of the flight, we're going to have to put on our pressure suits, two of us, and go outside to the solar telescope and collect all the film out of the different instruments that, that have taken the pictures and bring that back in and also load some film in the cameras for some of the other crews that are coming up. and. Uh, and then at that point in time after having done our EVA and collected the film out of the solar telescope we will spend the next two days preparing the vehicle for deactivation and our departure. 41 year old Dr. Joseph P. Kerwin designated Skylab science pilot has a doctor of medicine degree from Northwestern University. Born in Oak Park, Illinois, Kerwin is the first MD to go into space. Obviously the, the the most important immediate thing we need to know is can man live and work effectively and normally in space for long periods of time? Now, we're like the guys that were examining 
pilots and aircraft back in 1920 and 1921 and trying to arrive at medical standards for aviators and to protect them from the stresses of high altitude, cold exposure, so on and so forth. We're a supporting role. We need to know what happens to man in weightlessness, whether it's dangerous, if it's dangerous, what countermeasures can we apply so that we'll get through those days and uh, perhaps in the future fly very long missions. This knowledge can also contribute to an understanding of life processes which are basic to treating human illness. Besides extensive pre-flight and post-flight medical studies on each of the men, the trio will be put through what Dr. Kerwin calls dynamic measurements. The object of the in-flight measurements is to stress the man, to make him work, to make his body speed up, and then observe how efficiently it does the job. And we have two major experiments like that. One is a bicycle. It's one of those exercise type things, very carefully calibrated. Uh, you set it to a workload which you think will stress the individual because it did back on the ground. And then while he's running, you measure everything you conveniently can about him. You measure his heart rate, his blood pressure, you get an electrocardiogram on him. And most important, you measure in great detail the uh, composition of the gases that he breathes out so that you find out how much oxygen he is using, how much carbon dioxide he's, he's uh, breathing out. And you get from that a rough and ready but very valuable measure of how well this gentleman is able to coordinate his heart, his blood vessels, his muscles, and everything else to do a difficult physical job. The second major in-flight experiment is the lower body negative pressure device, which puts a different kind of stress on the body. Now what you do is you enter feet first into a, a garbage can kind of a thing up to your waist. Then you wrap a seal around your waist to make it airtight. And then with a vacuum hose, you suck the air out of the garbage can. This causes negative pressure on the lower part of the body. The veins expand, and blood is trapped or pooled in the lower half of the body, where it's not effectively used by the circulation. This is our clever way of simulating gravity while we're in weightlessness. Because if you stand upright for a long period of time, like soldiers on a parade ground, you, your blood does tend to pool this way in the lower part of your body and frequently people faint. This is why people faint in crowds. Uh, now how a man responds to a carefully measured stress of this kind is a good indication of how well his blood vessels and his heart can adjust. The people on the ground will be keeping a watchful eye on the crew, sometimes even as they sleep. This sleep monitoring cap, for instance, allows brainwave measurements to be made without wires being fastened to the head. The actual sleeping arrangements are rather unique, as astronaut Kerwin describes. Sleeping arrangements look different, and we always show them to visitors in the trainer as an example of the fact that you've got to think weightless. You've got to think of the fact that once you're in space, the rooms all get bigger because the walls and the ceiling now become just as useful to you as the floor. And they say, will it be distracting? And I say, I don't know because I haven't been there, but the guys who have say, yes, it's very distracting for a few days, and then you get used to it, and you don't really think about it anymore. Uh, what our sleeping arrangements are is we have three little cubicles side by side, uh, and in each of these cubicles, which is the standard six and a half feet tall, but very narrow, you have a sleeping bag, essentially, on an aluminum frame, and the only way to put it was straight up against the wall. I think that once you're in the sleeping bag, and by the way, you have to get in the sleeping bag through a hole in the neck of this blanket. It's a very interesting arrangement. You sort of, you know, coke bottle yourself in there, and you're all snug. Then uh, you have your little reading light on your right, and you have your little speaker box that you can talk to the ground if they call you. Uh, you don't have room service. If you uh, want to get a sandwich in the middle of the night, you've got to do that yourself. Looking at the Earth's resources from space will be a major part of every Skylab mission, a chance to survey everything from crops to schools of fish in the oceans, timberlands to mineral deposits. Forty-year-old Paul Weitz, a native of Erie, Pennsylvania, will have the main responsibility for conducting the Earth resources experiments on board this first Skylab. The Earth Resources Experiments Package is a group of five sensors which we're going to uh, use to look at the Earth to gather data with these five sensors 15 times during our flight. With that, the uh, data is collected on board and magnetic tape is brought back and uh, later reduced and analyzed here on Earth. Through it, we hope to 
uh, a myriad of things that we're going to find out. First off, we're going to find out how does the package perform as a package. In other words, did we pick the right mix of experiments with which to do the job? Now, uh, for example, some of the things are the states of health of foliage of different types, whether they be crops, trees, grasslands, pasture, what have you. Hopefully, can we uh, determine the depth of snow in a given region? Can we determine the, how fast the snow is melting at the rate of melt runoff? such that uh, downstream stations can be advised of when to open the gates on dams to predict how much water is coming down to help minimize flooding. Can we trace uh, thermal currents in the ocean or the Gulf of Mexico? Can we even uh, can we spot schools of fish? Can we s determine where underwater, excuse me, underground sources of water are located and uh, many, many other really practical applications. Some eight solar telescopes on Skylab will be aimed toward the sun, a vantage point that no one has ever had before. With solar power already being discussed as a possible means of easing our energy crisis, the solar physics studies take on added meaning and importance. We're going to be able to, to look at the sun in wavelengths that uh, were impossible to see before because the atmosphere filtered these out. And from this, we'll have a better understanding of the phenomena that are presently going on on the sun's surface, how it affects our lives on Earth now, how it's uh, affected our evolution and our history, and perhaps how we can better cope with changes that are coming up in the future. The astronauts will assess the value of devices that expedite moving from one place to another inside the orbital workshop. Here, astronaut Paul White's practices using one such device. It is believed that unique crystal structures can be manufactured in the vacuum of space. Again, astronaut Paul Weitz. Yes, the uh, primary experiment which we're doing is the, called the Metals Processing Facility in which we're going to... Uh, it's a sphere which can be sealed off from the interior of the spacecraft and uh, evacuated, that is, uh, pull a vacuum on it by exposing it uh, out to space outside the spacecraft and uh, in it we're going to do some welding, we're going to uh, melt some uh, metal samples to see if we can form some ball bearings practically in a weightless environment and in essence it's a determination of what are some of the phenomena that occur in a manufacturing process in a weightless environment and can they be used to a man's benefit. To stimulate interest in science and technology, 19 high school students have had experiments they proposed selected for flight on Skylab. The youngsters were selected from more than 3,400 nationwide. Some of their experiments include behavior of bacteria and bacterial spores in the Skylab and space environments, web formation in zero gravity, and others. By way of summary, science pilot Dr. Joe Kerwin had this to say about Skylab. I like to think of it like this. We have explored Earth orbital space, and we have explored lunar orbital space in the surface of the moon, and this is very exciting. These people were kind of the Lewis and Clarks of the space program. What we're trying to do now is settle. We're trying to homestead space. We're trying to demonstrate on Skylab that man has a useful function as an observer and a, a scientist, a technician, a doer of things, a bringer back of information in space in that we can and should do this in a cost-effective, regular, long-term way. Sun to Earth observations. Its experiments will eventually contribute to improving life on our planet. This special report brought to you by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration.